Welcome to The Contrarians, and tonight we have a great panel lined up. The topic, do band conflicts produce a better product? When bands have conflicts, do they make better albums? Are they more productive? I don't know. Let's throw it out to the panel and see what they think. So let's get started. Contrarians, and tonight we have a Patreon suggested topic. And this topic tonight was suggested by our own very own, if I can get my fingers and the arrows right, Peter Jones. So the the, the topic for tonight, ladies and gentlemen, do conflicts and fight within a band actually help produce a better product? So we've got a fine panel here tonight. Like I said, this is suggested by Peter. We've got Tom here tonight, Pontus, and Joe B. You can't ask for a better panel so uh, since peter came up with this topic i'm going to turn it over to him first and uh i don't know we're just gonna have a general discussion and see how this where this goes you know how it is on the contrarian so uh explain it a bit and uh give us your thoughts very good thank you grant of Again, course nice to see everybody and uh, happy holidays around the globe um, you know, this was something that I was thinking about as, you know, all of this KISS stuff is coming to a supposed end and, uh, you know, the, all of the back and forth and the bickering and the, the comments in the press and the things that were attributed and not attributed, what was real, what wasn't. The point is, is that throughout a lot of our music history, there's bands that have had all kinds of conflicts, some more public than others. But how does it affect art? How does it affect what they're actually making and what they're creating? And what is the outcome of that conflict or these fightings? So I thought I would just pick a couple groups. Um, I'll just give some general thoughts and whether I think they, it was helpful or not helpful. Um, and as we go around, people can throw theirs out and then we can kind of uh, just all kind of comment on ones that people have already mentioned. So um, the first one I'm going to look at is Metallica versus Dave Mustaine. And the reason I'm picking this one is because obviously Dave was an original member and was <laughs> summarily asked to leave. And the conflict between the two of them, more specifically Megadeth and Metallica, is one of the biggest feuds in, in that genre. And so the question is, has that actually made things better for us, the listener? And I would suggest absolutely. Because I think having a common villain, or what I wrote down, revenge makes for great art. When you have something to prove, you really kind of put everything on the line. And Dave has had to kind of play second fiddle, in some people's opinions, maybe not mine, to Metallica his whole career. And that is a strong motivator. And that is a strong drive to come out with this great a material as you can, the I'll show you or I'll prove you wrong mentality. We see it in sports, we see it in business, we see it in everything, but it's not, it's, it's also true in art. So I think in that case, while the interpersonal conflicts are probably a lot more painful at their level, for us as artists, I think we were the huge winners here on this one. Um, if he had stayed in Metallica, we don't know what that would have looked like and we certainly wouldn't have had Megadeth and I think that's a shame. So from, from that one, I would say that's, that's a big winner. Um, one of the other ones, and this one was the one that kind of drove me to think of the whole topic in the first place, besides the KISS thing, is, is the Deep Purple history. Um, you know, we can talk about Blackmore, and you could have Blackmore versus Gillen. You could have Blackmore versus Dio. You could have Blackmore versus everybody. <laughs> um, but specifically with, with Deep Purple, this feud and conflict that he's had with Ian Gillen and what did that do and what did what did that produce um, while they were together clearly it produced something spectacular in my opinion they're my favorite band but in this case it produced something that imploded we ended up at, at their prime in my, in my opinion if you're looking at 72 73 and he gave basically a year's notice so it was really kind of in 72 when he says I'm gone 
And it was such a shame because this was such a prolific band. And there was also a sub context in there and not from a fight or, or aggressiveness standpoint, but from a musical standpoint, there was always a battle every night on stage between John Lord and Ian Pace and Richie Blackmore as to who could one up the other one on stage. And that is one of the things that I admire the most about them yeah. is that they did it on a musical level. One of them would start something and John would be right there all of a sudden adding the harmony and changing it. And then they Pacey would catch on to it rhythmically and you just, the, the levels just kept rising. It was sad. They broke up. We get back perfect strangers era. Does it create the same kind of magic? No, not in my opinion. And we have some more breakups. We get last hurrah with battle rages on. And I look at the live concert of hell or high water. And to me, this is where the, the evidence of tension makes great art. They were so furious with each other that, but what came out was just literal fire. It was it's so intense. And it's some of their best live playing that they had done since the early seventies. So from a musician's standpoint, I'm like, go ahead, butt heads a little bit. I'm okay with it, but not to the point of it blowing up. And once it gets to that point, then I think we're cheated and then it becomes a problem. Um, I've got other ones, but we'll we'll let on other people go and we'll we'll throw theirs in and, and we'll go from there. How about that? Yeah, that sounds good. All Maybe right. I should be in on on, oh, on the Blackmore please do Pontus bubble thing because it's like um it's like sort of uh you I agree with you. It's like a gasoline to fire. It's like you know uh, um it's like they 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 do it and it's so intense that it actually burns them out. But while they're burning, they're really, really good at it. I mean, if if Blackmore is is a very interesting person, since he also, I mean, not only does he break up with Gillen, which is one of his best singers, he also breaks up breaks up with Dio, is one of <laughs> another great band he could have had, another great singer could have worked endlessly with. But he right. he he becomes an ABBA fan and decides he wants to do do pop, um, do AR. And 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 that sort of the whole British sort of um, incestuous thing where people walk to one band and then to the next, uh, it's it's hilarious. But at the same time, it creates this universe that we as listeners can dwell on and dwell in. And you know, really, I remember uh, when I was thirteen, I got my first. A Taste of Purple, I got the uh, picture discs uh, of um, Ian Rock and Machine Head and Fireball. And then a friend left the Whitesnake live album from 80, Live in the Heart of the City. And suddenly you realize that some people were there and some people worked on that record. And there was a universe there and you followed and you realized that, you know, this is a um, more family thing. Uh, and sometimes the pe these people can work together and sometimes they, they can't stand each other. And it sort of benefits, you know, we get more music out of them. I mean, Led Zeppelin was four musicians that very seldom deaverate from, from, from the original lineup. And, and right. when they split up, well, I mean, Robert Plant made okay music, but it wasn't in the, in the, in the realm of 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 the Zeppelin, it wasn't to the core. It wasn't on par with Zeppelin, really. It was another thing. But with Purple, we can actually go. If you if you dig Purple, you if you dig that band, you go to. Then suddenly you have all the Black Sabbath albums and all the you know you have the Gillen albums and you have the Rainbow albums and then suddenly you have the Michael Schenker Group albums and you have uh, the Nazareth album with that Roger Glover produced. And you have the whole uh, sort of, you, it never ends. It never ends. And it starts with that conflict between certain people who can't really, at the end, just get along. And 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 it also the point where people wants to go, you know, go further. And I want to go in this route. Mm -hmm. And I want to go in this route. Mm -hmm. So I jump ship. And this is very interesting. I read Robert Fripp once said, in, for King Crimson, he said that, one of the most uh, one of the most sort of f fragile per um, periods for a band is the writing process because then everybody's got to ship in 
and the recording process. And that is the most fragile sort of thing for a band because you go to the next level and who's going who's gonna to deliver that and who's going to deliver this? And are we going on the same page? Mm. Are we on tour? We know what to play. We know, you know, at least we know where we're going. And that can be frictional as well. But you have this sort of, um, when when people are writing and people are finding ideas, then they really knuckle heads with each other. Well, and it's it's a it's personal. Yeah, in, uh, art is personal, whether it's in a group setting or not. It comes from an individual, yeah. and you do have a stake in it emotionally, um, and and it can be a cutting experience to have those things rejected you know we've i mean adrian smith we can look at we can go through band after band after band mm. where you know well look peter chris's thing was my songs aren't getting selected from gene and, and paul okay uh, we're not talking about quality or versus not quality we're talking about acceptance versus non-acceptance that's mm. what we're talking about and if you feel that you're not being accepted you're out yeah one classic example of that is you have two members who write everything and there's a third member who wants to write and they say, oh, yeah, you can write a song here, you can write a song there. And we end up with all things must pass. <laughs> you know, it's, it, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All righty. Wow. This is incredible. Um, I guess I think we'll just, let's go over to Joe B and let's hear what Joe has to say. And we'll just go, then we'll go to Tom. So, um, and. I guess we'll go back to Pontus. It's just a good conversation. I'm not exactly what sure what order we should go, but let's throw it over to Joe B and get his thoughts on this. I've been pondering this all day. It's a great topic, and so many bands came to mind. It's in, but Metallica and the Megadeth uh, uh, scenario did not come to my mind. Uh, it's interesting you brought that up, and yes, we as fans benefited from that. But there's bands out there. So there's one band you want to talk about that was successful they got along there was no real conflict and that's rush so yeah. i think that the and and the songwriting credits pretty much were balanced out yeah i think a lot of this boils down to you, know, you see the, you have these young hungry bands they want to make it but then like i saw this interview with billy corgan he said when they started getting after the first album his manager and lawyer said you want to get you know split the songwriting credits and keep the band together or do you want to rate all the songs and then eventually the band breaks up and he goes, I want to, I'm doing all the work. I want all the credit. Right. That's what happened. So their <laughs> legacy was tarnished. Yeah. Van Halen, as big as Van Halen is, they could have been a lot bigger and there. It was just stupidity and conflict. You have drugs come into the, the picture. You have alcohol along with the songwriting credits and it tarnished their legacy. They're not, you know, you don't hear any, a lot of Van Halen songs being played at sporting events or on car commercials or anything. And that's what's driving the legacy of these bands. But then you have the Rolling Stones, you know, the Rolling Stones has been a roller coaster. You know, Mick and, obviously Mick and Keith don't like each other, but there was a period in the late eighties, I think before Steel Wheels, where they were, they were auditioning Terrence Trent Darby. So I, you know, I think a lot of times for the most part, these conflicts, boil to the point where the music and legacy of the band suffer. You know, the Black Sabbath Ozzy scenario, it, it worked out for us as fans, but the Black Sabbath name was tarnished for years. You know, he was coming out with Tony Iommi's solo projects until they got back with Ozzy in the late 90s. It came back. And that boils down to, I think, what really keeps, or you know, get these reunions or get these bands back together or back on track with Metallica even. You have to have great management, great promotion, and you got to make sure everybody gets a piece of the pie money wise. Mm -hmm. um, Aerosmith's another one. It, it, you know, it, 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 they had a horrible breakup. Yeah. The tension was there. We, I mean, like sweet emotion is, is one of their most popular songs. And that was written by all tension. That was Steven Tyler's hatred for Joe Perry's wife. But eventually it really tarnished the band. They broke up and why, how did they get back together? Good management. You know, good promotion. They had to get off, get semi clean, you know, off the drugs. Well, so. they were also broke. They were broke, exactly. Yeah. Money. Broke Money. has a lot yeah. to do with yeah. it. That helps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. you're right. You're right. Yeah. I mean, so many different factors go into there. The Black Crows are another one. The brothers don't get along. They're finally back yeah. together. But obviously, someone put enough money on the table. Hearts going through something too. You know, it, 
<laughs> what happens when these sisters that formed a band and they loved each other, then all of a sudden the one's husband slaps the, the smacks the hell out of the one, other one's uh, sons. And all of a sudden there's tension, you know, yeah, sin well, just happened in the last 10 years, right? Well, I so, guess they're coming back together, though. That's what I thought. Yeah, if radio, Live so. Nation throws enough money at them and their management can get, <laughs> but, you know, I was money. I was at. Let's, let's relearn Barracuda quick. <laughs> yeah, by coincidence, I stayed at their hotel when they played in Indianapolis. After that happened, they got back together, and I heard some roadies talk, or and, and they were just. And Joan Jett was opening up. They said nothing but good things to say about Joan Jett. I was just overhearing the conversation over breakfast. But man, they were like they couldn't wait for the tour to get over because they couldn't stand Ann Wilson, you know. So Guns and Roses is another one I was thinking about. Uh, just the drugs, the tension. Yeah, they, they were a hungry band. They fought, but man, I mean, if if they actually kind of were on the same page, stayed away from the drugs a little bit, went the way of the Rolling Stones, they, we could have had a lot better product come out. We wouldn't have to wait mm -hmm. 10, 20 years for Chinese Democracy to come out, which is basically an Axl Rose solo album. Yeah, yeah, they got back together, but why? Because of money and, and management. So I think for the most part, um, I, 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 the tension within the band isn't a good thing. Uh, you need that cohesiveness, but I guess that's rock and roll, and that's what happens. You know, Rolling Stones are a band that uh, weathered the storm, uh, but there's not a lot of other ones out there. And you get a lot of most of the other ones are reunions. Metallica, yeah, they weathered the storm, but that whole movie, some kind of monster, you know. You're like, what the what the heck is going on here? You know? Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a lot of love in that movie. No, no. no. And you had to get a therapist to come into yeah. The whole Stones thing though, that's basically a business. When did yeah. the Stones become a business? What, 73, 74? About 75. Yeah. They were yeah. they were also 75. broke. They, they were, were also yeah, broke, broke. In I mean, I'm thinking around some girls, maybe even later. I it, that's when mm. I thought they really you know took the rocket ship, strapped onto the yeah. rocket ship. But yeah. yeah. So it's just weird. Some of these bands you consider bands, but are they really bands anymore? It's just kind of a facade. You know, another band that I, I, I know we're just jumping around is the police. Exactly. Sting and Stuart Copeland always That's... went at it, but they've always went at it. But when they put out albums, great records, you know, but they all, uh oh, that's probably what Tom was going to talk about. Oh, yeah. About. I'm well, you, we can bounce it over to you. We'll you know, it's no, interesting. No, we can you just keep it. the police because, um, I, and I'll, I'll end my session here. Maybe yeah, I'll go ahead. With, but the food, uh, Dave Grohl, you know, so uh, Dave Grohl and, and Taylor Hawkins and, and um, um, Stuart Copeland were very close. And mm -hmm. there was discussions, obviously, you know, rest in peace. But I know that Dave Grohl, for the fact, when he put the, when he actually eventually had a band, he made sure everybody was equally compensated, whether on tour. Yeah. So it wouldn't happen. But Well, well the Foo yeah. Fighters seems like, to me, when I do, like what you say, Joe, I think the Foo Fighters are a healthy band. Obviously, yeah. you know. It's All almost other... like a family, but a, a family the that's not OD, dysfunctional. Though, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. You know, he had issues before. It's rock yeah. and roll, but yeah. But still, they seem to get along, and I, I don't know. It's well, I'll example. just throw this in on the police before Tom can grab it. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is you mentioned the Stones, but they were continually adding new music, and they were doing new releases and creating more art. Unless I missed something, there wasn't some great studio record that came out of the reunion from the police tour. There was a, there was no new no. anything. Money. No. All it was was, hey, we all missed this band. They left when they were number one on every chart on every country on the planet. Yeah. There's Sting says there's nowhere else to go. We're done. So that's the question. Like it, when the police first formed, were they, was there tension there or were they working as a cohesive unit of three guys that just wanted to make it? I think there was always tension there from I what so I understand. Too. Yeah, there was tension, but they, but you're right. They, they had that group, that group thing when they started to like, let's make it together. I think they knew that together they could make it. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and that, I think, I think they had a common enemy. I mean, they, they had a, they had a common enemy. They wanted to succeed. Mm -hmm. That's and, what I was uh, saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give them, give somebody a focus. Until all of a sudden, guess what? You've reached it. You're yeah. there. Now mm. that, that you know, everybody has always said, at least the people I talk to as Aerosmith fans, all through the 80s and the 90s and everything, were like, wow, when are we going to get Rocks 2? When are we going to get Rocks 2? Well, you were never going to get it. Yeah. Why? Because they're not pissed off anymore. They're not broke and aggressive and They're angry. not on drugs. And no, they're not. Mm. They're, they're content, rich, mm. and satisfied. And yeah. that does not make angst. 
No, no, that's it's great. like I mean, when they get really successful, you're not going to get those records where they're hungry and they're creative and they're really right. trying to build something. But they you, just kind of go through the some, motions. Yeah. It's like when Pink Floyd made Dark Side of the Moon. They said they did. They cracked it. They, and then they said the next record, they were sitting around going, what do we, what do, we do now? Yeah. Good and point. They, they, yeah. So. But, but they got broke. They, got they made broke great records. Oh, yeah, exactly. But the, the thing is, with, with Pink Floyd, is there was still, obviously, this un, unrelenting tension between Gilmore and Waters. And because of that, creativity builds and rises to an apex because no 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 i don't think that's good enough no that's not good enough why are you doing that we should do that mm -hmm. it's it's very common now after the fact that we look at wish you were here and gilmore wanted to go more in the directions of what became animals and roger says you're missing the boat here and gilmore admits i was wrong roger was correct and what we got were two seminal albums out of it yeah. okay yeah. once we jumped on board there's okay well it's better than us not having anything and we do have to move forward mm -hmm. um and the difficulties of being as popular as all of a sudden they became but there was still that tension that was creating high art so in that sense while it was really bad personnel wise again mm -hmm. holy smokes we get wish you were here we get animals we get the wall that's that's a career times 10 for almost every other band. Forget yeah. their other material. And, yeah, and it didn't tip over until 1980, right? Didn't It didn't fall over until the final cut, really. Right. No. But well, it, I don't it, know. But... That is very interesting because because if you take out, that is an also a, a, a case of the sum is bigger than the parts. Because if you take, when, you, when they took out Rick Wright, the whole thing just disappeared. You know, it became... You know, the, the final cut, which I consider a Roger Waters solo album with the others playing on it. Uh, just, um, but, but the, the, six, the, 68, the 68 to 79 group, the, the quartet that made those albums, arrived in intention and, yes. and, and just, just, just made fantastic music out of that. And, and when, you, when you listen to the solo albums, it's, well, if it hadn't said David Gilmore, if it hadn't said Roger Waters, we haven't, you know, we wouldn't bother, <laughs> really, <laughs> sadly. But um, I, I also thought about the Stones. I think it's interesting to say, you know, you form a band when you're 19 mm -hmm. or 18 or whatever, and suddenly you grow up and suddenly you, you're still with these people. You're still, you're still making your career. You're still with, at work with those people. You don't. You you can't change it. You have to. You have to live with these people that you, you that you like when you when nineteen when you suddenly are 40, 40 and you, you you your whole situation has changed. You're not the same person, but you're right. still with these people, and and of course that is you know you have to grow together or you grow apart. And I think that was exactly what happened in the eighties for them. They just fuck. I want to go out. I want to. I want something else. <laughs> but Pontus, it's the Beatles scenario. Yeah. Everybody been together since, you know, John and Paul have been together since 14. You know, by the time they made it, they'd been together for years. People yeah. on the outside looked at it and go, oh, they're a brand new band. But no, yeah. we've been to Hamburg for you years. Know, you, know? you know, by the time we get to the late 60s, they're done. They yeah, but if you sat through that, that, it was actually really good, but it's so funny. Oh, the documentary? But, yeah. 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 They, they actually seem to have gotten along. Like well, they was, got along, but there didn't you know. seem like to be a lot. Of, it looked. It seemed like the tension was in the press, but if you looked at that those sessions, there wasn't a lot of tension there. Fine. And it yeah. kind of like they just. And then John Lennon was doing tons of drugs. I don't. <laughs> yes, yeah, so he seemed fairly together to me, except for like maybe one day. But you yeah. know, I don't know. I, well, there yeah. there were moments though. You're like, okay, John, what's going? Because you knew that in the early days he took charge, and he would just. There were times where he would be sitting there like whispering to Yoko, and I'm sure that was pissing everybody off. Like, come on, focus on. I the think band. Paul yeah. was always in charge, though. Paul was the one that ran the sessions. He'd say, "All right, boys, it's time to go back into the studio. You have any songs?" I'm not if sure. It went for the Paul. They never would do anything. Probably. I I tend to lean more towards Tom in this. Early on, I do think it was John. And. And, you know, Grant, you and I have talked about this because I'm, I'm this odd Beatles fan that has a timeline. Yeah. Because mm. I, I love from the beginning through 66. That's when I 
love them and I don't own and stop listening to buy stuff after 66 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because John is, is, is my favorite and the focus is on John. But if you look post 66 and it started to, if you watch the curve, Whoa, yeah. of, well, of 65 is when it started to change. Whose songs yeah. were Paul's and whose were John's? You can, mm. they're, 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 but it is, it's so, trying the, to, Beatles, the Beatles are so odd because it, they just kind of just broke up, you know, and that, then the tension created and John and Paul are writing songs about each other. Yeah. Well, one, one, one thing I think broke the band was the fact that, um, the other three wanted Alan Klein and Paul wanted his yeah. uh yeah. Yeah. so they know management, yeah. Yeah, management. And, and that's a, I mean that's what broke up Van Hagar for the most part because Sandy yeah. Sandy's yes. manager yep. died and then they got Rush's manager and then it fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he doesn't Sammy Sammy always said, Oh, he's whispering in Eddie's ear, you need your band back and all this stuff. Yeah, like it was that was causing division in that band for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, that becomes yeah. a business, it gets big. And you read yeah. the Noel Monk, the Noel Monk book with yeah. Roth. It, it was just all of a sudden, you know, they were doing tons of coke and they're making money, and they like, okay, we're done. Like, it kind of just, it was, it would, it, yeah, it's so strange. But if there was some tension there, a lot of tension, obviously, it, it didn't do the band any favors in that, in that respect. Well, you know, Roth left. He got Steve I got Billy Sheehan in the band, created mm. a, a, an amazing band. You know, it's kind of like the Metallica thing with Dave Mustaine. Dave had to go out and prove himself, you know, whether yeah. it's better than, you know, 51. Right. 50, I don't, that's the, the interesting thing. Very, very, but he did. It was a, that's a good record. You have to admit Dave was on fire, you know. That's another interesting thing because 1984 was such a big success mm -hmm. and they couldn't, they couldn't just continue past that with their lineup. Because that that was also recorded during, you know, a lot of tensions, and, and I also read that book, and it's it's fucking beautiful. It's just wonderful to know that man. You know, <laughs> it's it just it's just it's just a it's just a great book. Go and read it. Run yeah, I haven't read it. It is really yeah. good. It's really good. Yeah, and it, there's so many hilarious stories about people, but it's it 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 shows that you know because I remember I didn't know Van Halen that well in '83. I knew them through jump when i was 12 and then van hager van halen 86 happened and they were bigger you know that album row the 1984 sort of um train because you know everybody knew van halen then but you know they changed they changed the singer but everybody wanted the band so so they could they could actually succeed within with another singer but uh that is a very interesting and that, that the way that ends with no music from so many years, mm -hmm. it just implodes. That yeah. is so sad. It's so sad for for music's sake. It's so so sad. Yeah. Did you have some other ones, Tom? Yeah, Tom. Uh, yeah. Well, I yeah, sure. So I um. Well, first of all, I wanted to say we were talking about Deep Purple and talk about you were talking about. Um, first of all, great topic. I love this topic. I mean, it's obviously going in so many directions because it's so it's kind of a deep topic because really, mm -hmm. does conflict within a band help to make things better? I said yes, but there's a thing like we were talking about as we're discussing. It's like creative tension versus all out warfare. I mean, you know, it's like creative mm -hmm. tension is good and create can can create something great like animals or something like that or the wall, you know, but. Uh, when it comes into, you know, all out conflict where like, I think Richie Blackmore does start to like, I mean, like, here's an example of something to prove, you know, when, when the band breaks up is, I think this album's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a good record. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, you know, he didn't get along with Coverdale either. He must not like lead singers or so. I don't know. But, um, but. Well, if I, mean, I could just for one second, Tom, and I'll throw it right back to you. Sure. I would suggest to you that this topic can even be microcosm down Blackmore was always in conflict with himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blackmore was never content with anything of, about mm. himself or anything else around him. And that it, of itself it, is kind of a walking piece of radioactivity because yeah. it, no matter what he gets, he's going to be okay for a while, but is he really kind of happy? Is he compromising? Is he, is he, and it's doomed before yeah. it ever gets going because of himself. Yeah yeah, 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 like it's like the the enemy within, as Rush, Rush once said. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. Um, 
So, but even speaking of Rush, I mean, they even had, I mean, talk about, you know, you, I just read the, the Getty Lee book and it's incredible, by the way. I don't know if you guys read it, but it's, it's awesome. And Amazing. it's, uh, yeah. Working talks, on mine. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's very long, but it's awesome if you're a fan. And he talks yeah. about, you know, obviously in the eighties, you know, even he and Alex had a little bit of like, you know, hold your fire where it was like, okay, you're dude, you're too many keyboards and synths. I need, this is a guitar band. So they, they actually did. I mean, they were, of course, worked it out, but, uh, but they even had tension. Um, but, uh, and then there's those bands like REM that they're like, you know, we're splitting everything four ways. Everything's equal. You know, like we were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, that, um, but I was going to say another couple examples, of course, we were talking about the police. I had to bring the police up because to me, yeah. I mean, I, it's just such a blatant example of tension within a band creating something great. I mean, I listen to, cause you listen to Sting solo records and they just don't do much for me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a huge police guy. I love the police. And so there's something about the Stuart Copeland dynamic with Sting where, you know, Stuart would always say, oh, the police are my band because he started the band. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I'm sure Sting loved that. Right. Um, but Sting, <laughs> when he, he Stuart discovered Sting in, in, in this band called The Last Exit in Newcastle, he's playing with this jazz rock band. And he's like, that guy's got star potential. He's an amazing singer, great bass player. That guy is a star. I can tell. Mm -hmm. And he found him and said, do you want to be in a punk band with me? And the guy's like, Sting's like, what? And he's like, punk is the thing that's happening, man. We've got to get into a punk band and start hitting the clubs. And that's exactly what they did. But so through the history of the band, Stewart's always thinking, well, this is my band. The police is my band. Mm -hmm. And and staying more and more as he's writing more and more hits, more and more hits, all of a sudden his power is gaining, gaining slowly, slowly. And the next thing you know, Sting's the guy. He's making, he's the golden goose. And it becomes this like alpha thing but, where both are just fighting all the time. Look, but you, but they always knew something. though. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Well, they've always knew they only had Sting for a certain amount of time because yeah. yeah. Stewart totally got it. They knew he was so beyond the beyond mm -hmm. that they only had him for an infinite amount of time. And well, obviously, synchronicity was it. But it's funny if you look about you were saying how you don't dig the Sting solo stuff so much. I like some of it. But it, if you look at synchronicity and then look at uh, Dream of the Blue Turtles, it's kind of like right. a natural progression the way Sting kept keeps moving. You know, because yeah. you can kind of see in synchronicity. Songs. Still yeah. writes great songs, but he does what he wants. But I don't know. Yeah. But that I think the police are a perfect example of making brilliant music out of conflict, though. Well, like, and this yeah. is what happens within a band when an individual becomes too overly the focal point, mm -hmm. where you can almost say, well, it's Sting and the police. Well, no, it's the police. Mm -hmm. It's mm. not Sting. Yeah, yeah. Isn't there a greatest hit that says Sting and the Police? I'm like, what? And, and yeah, the, yeah. Look, the Doobie Brothers went through the exact same thing. Yeah. All of a sudden, Michael McDonald <laughs> right. is the voice yeah. of yeah. the Doobie Brothers, and mm -hmm. older fans are going, whoa, 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 stop. Tom Johnston, man, come on. Well, yeah, and, and Patrick kind of, you know, kept the things together and kept it right. going, but there was a lot of backlash. They're like, Mike, come on, we're not Steely Dan, man. Okay. <laughs> well, they tried to turn it into Steely Dan. They tried to, they tried, yeah, yeah. Well, and commercially, I mean, they would the, the, the great story. And I saw their original farewell tour. Joe, were you at uh uh Chicago Fest when they were there? Yes. It was so crowded, you literally were like, you could not wow. move. We were so far back from the stage, the PA couldn't even throw that far back. I could barely hear them. Amazing. There were so many people. But the point was, is that when Get Closer and Minute by Minute and then more Get Closer, all of a sudden they've got all these hits. They're like, the band just bloody broke up. We don't have a band. And they're like, oh, no, you've got one of the hottest songs in the in the country. You're like, you got to go back out. And they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. And it's, you know, then you know you're doomed. Yeah. And, it's, and it had to break apart and it had to go back to Tom and Patrick. It had to go back to that foundation. And now if you want to bring in Michael, fine. Mm -hmm. But they reestablished who they were. Yeah. And we're able to do that, even with some new studio records, which were pretty decent. Mm -hmm. um, but they took over. Yeah. And when the singer does that, you're like, oh, no, I'm I, I'm the voice. I'm I'm uh, I'm the good. I'm the guy. And that can be very toxic. So here's here's another example. One more. And that is the this because I, I always this band always got me like I love their first three albums. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it kind of falls off for me. And I'm like, what changed? Right. And I was thinking about this and I'm thinking about it. I'm like, so, so I like, I love this album uh, and yeah. I'm going, Pete Willis is the guy that was in the band for the first three records. And apparently he was fired for being alcoholic or drinking too much or something. And, but I, I mean, it was like, wasn't this a hard drinking band, but, but anyway, 
Yeah, the other so, guitarist wound up drinking himself. Drinking himself. Drink. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So so anyway, so I did a little bit of research because I was like, what's the deal? Because I just love, I mean, I, on through the night, high and dry, and and uh and and uh pyromania. I mean, those three are just like I love them. They're just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's like that they're like riffs galore, you know, the riffs for all time, right? And it's maybe it's the combination of Steve Clark and Pete Willis, those two guitar players together just, just created magic. Mm. And apparently he would show up to the pyromania sessions like drunk from the night before or something like that. And I think he would give a lot of lip to Mutt Lang. And I, I think Mutt Lang hated like he would challenge Mutt Lang and Mutt Lang was like, I don't know who the, what the problem is. Guys are drunk and maybe we need to get him out of the I think he poisoned the rest of the band on this guy, Pete Willis. And who knows? I don't know the whole story, but but basically mm. he ended up leaving the band. And I just think it was never the same. There's something about the like, it, don't get me wrong. I, I agree with you musically, but mm -hmm. commercially. Well, I that's mean, true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's I know. But Mutt Lane, but Mutt, you know, that you bring up another point, the producer. Mutt Lane kind of took over the band, you know? Yeah, yeah. Bob yeah. Rock started taking over Metallica. Metallica, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I, I'm, you talk about the one member like Sting that just dominates the band, Billy Corgan, you know? Yeah. He, he did all the heavy lifting. It was just him and, and, uh, and the drummer basically on mm -hmm. those albums and Jimmy he wrote Chamberlain. all the songs and then eventually he had drug problems or conflicts and he's making all the money on the songwriting credits and it just imploded and he, then he made he didn't make very smart decisions either you well, know let another throw, thing, go on I'm sorry let me let me throw this in for a second because i'm going to look at something in that's now going and starting to happen with portnoy returning to dream theater this was a guy who when he was originally in the band did everything yeah he, yeah he did their set list he did their promo he did their album art he did everything now is that going to sit with the other four or is he just going to come back and say well i'm just going to play drums if you know portnoy's personality i don't that's think that's gonna... not likely to happen mm. might just go back to the way he was doing things i don't know mm. oh you know what band i really forgot to motley crew is the poster child for <laughs> <laughs> yeah dysfunction i mean yeah holy cow and it did implode in the 90s they you know with vince but yeah, yeah. i don't know it, it yeah it didn't create anything worth talking about no and again bob rock pretty much pushed him with dr feelgood that was their i mean they they yeah i mean nikki six even admitted he was he was strung out on heroin and for some reason two of their albums sold millions of copies you know tommy lee saved saved the one album yeah. But well, if I can throw this one out real fast, because a lot of we think this is like a 70s or 80s thing. No, this happened. There's a lot of stories. You know, we can go over the kinks. We can obviously the Beatles are a great story. The Everly Brothers couldn't stand each other and they were even suing each other from the grave, you know, and that was just an ugly situation. But for me, I think the one that really stood out to me was Cream. Because here you had a band of very high profile musicians came together. And from the very first time they're together, Jack Bruce and Ginger Breaker are almost at fist fights with each other. They, well, they hated each other in the previous in the previous band. Yeah, yeah. they, they would not. And they're like, "Who's yeah. going to be in the band?" Oh, and they're like, "Who oh, cares?" No. You know, but but Ginger had a respect for Bruce as a musician, mm -hmm. and he's yeah. like, "Okay." Yeah. And obviously, all the things we've seen about uh, Ginger late in his career that's the one thing he would hold on to is that if he respected you as a musician, you were okay. Hmm. Well, so this tension and this tension and this tension and in three short years, change rock and roll. Mm -hmm. They change everything. But hmm. the tensions are so horrible, you completely run Eric Clapton out of the room screaming like this. I can't. Yeah, he was neutral it. on everything. He was he like, couldn't, he the couldn't take even the peace. Oh, hmm. it, it must have been torture. It must have yeah. been. For him to and then he, then he and then he goes to to Steve Winwood and tries to write an album and who shows up? Right, <laughs> freaking Ginger Winwood Baker. brought in Ginger Baker for God's sakes. Right, was it? Uh, Ginger's like, yeah, hey, I heard you guys up. are jamming. That sounds no, like fun. Oh, I think it was. I thought Winwood had something to do with that. <laughs> and so this is this in the again the collective. None of them ever did anything that could touch Cream after yeah. that. I mean, Eric's obviously had a long super career. But for my personal tastes, it was they were never remotely close to what they were able to do with the three of them together. And you mm -hmm. talked about royalties. My favorite, one of my favorite moments is that when in Beware of Mr. Baker, he's sitting there talking about uh, White Room 
And he's like, oh, that, that intro is a Bolero thing. He says, I wrote that. And he says, every time it gets played, he's like, you know, fucking Jack gets a check and I don't get shit. <laughs> well, there it is. Mm -hmm. mm. It wouldn't be the same without those drums, man. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there he gets a check and I go get How shit. Do you, here's a question for the panel. You know, now we're talking about conflicts. What about these mid-level bands that like you have three different versions of rats or two different versions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. You know, or like I'm going to, I, I just interviewed fog hat. There's only one original member. Uh, it, That's one had, more than foreigner. Yeah, it's true. Oh, that, <laughs> yeah. Please don't. <laughs> At least foreigner. there's just one foreigner. Kinda. Yeah. They were brutal last time I saw them, but yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. And if Mick Jones is tired, there's no, there's nobody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. How many great whites are there? I, I... Yeah. I, yeah. Sweet, At least so two. Okay. I mean, yeah. And you wonder, like, how many, how much money they spend on like, like Journey. Here's another one. Well, yeah. LA Guns came back together. They <laughs> were going on LA tour Guns. again, and I, I, I don't, I, I think the lawsuit between the Jonathan Kane and Neil Sean hasn't been. I maybe they settled. I don't know, and that's why they're touring. But it's been quiet. It's been they're quiet. always suing each other. Like every other always, year. there's always something wrong yeah. with Journey. There's always yeah. something. Wrong. It's another business man, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I think I, I was going to say that in this, in that. Pink Floyd's episode where about a momentary lapse of reason, you know, my thought is that during the eighties, these bands became brands. Yeah. Yep. They became so much brands that it, it didn't matter who was in it. I mean, Pink Floyd could sell out shows in just name and they just played the dark side of the moon and all this 70s stuff. And Roger Waters couldn't be arrested. You know, <laughs> he could, yeah. you know, yeah, you know, and it's 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 very sort of, and it, and that started that because when you look at those albums, you know, they're Pink Floyd albums, but nearly only name. They just, and and the same goes with all these other bands that you know. Um, you have you have the, as you mentioned, Free Rats and all that, you know, because people want to see rats, but they don't care what, who's in it. And as long as the band is good, it's okay. But look who you just have two yeses, final, for instance. Look who well, just I had would... their final show. No one, <laughs> the majority of the audience does not care that Ace and Peter are up there. They, I, yeah. I've been a show where they thought that I, they, oh, hey, that's Ace Frilly. No, it's been Tommy Thayer for right. like years, 20 years, years, right? years right? you know. But yeah, 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 those, those are well, definitely I, casual fans. Yeah. Well, well, and it's interesting because I, and we also need to bring up the Eagles because exactly, oh, they're yeah. epic. Um, and this is one of those cases on the shows we've had before is, you know, is too much information a bad thing? Yeah. I didn't need to ever know anything about these guys because they're all pieces of crap. Yeah. You yeah. know, they're just subhumans, all of them. Mm. Now I thought, okay, you've replaced a guitarist and a bass player before the whole Felder thing is, is, is nonsense, but, but then you lose Fry and people are still going. Mm. Making money, people don't care. I guess got his son. Right? Maybe the songs, maybe the songs are what bring but, them in. You, you know, know maybe the songs are more powerful than the band. Who's left in ACDC? You know what I mean? Uh, it, yeah, they were cohesive. They got along. Phil but... Rudd, right? Well, Phil, Phil and drunk. Cliff's back. Yeah, but Phil oh, didn't Cliff's play back? a power trip. <laughs> Mm. Cliff, Cliff came. Uh, Cliff came back. Yeah, I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Phil didn't play live with them at the Power Trip no. show. But yeah, I know. No. Yeah, they came back from the album, and it's a great album. But yeah, you know, that's a whole different scenario. I guess they get along, and they just did. But, but you know what? That's what. There's where you know you read stories about Malcolm and Angus fighting because they're brothers. I mean, I got that's three okay. Look at Shanker. They the living crap Shanker. out of each other, and then they, yeah, get along. The ones. they have their well, brother they, they ones. that. Uh. Were... <laughs> well, yeah. I think it matters how the band meets its demise that we talked about zeppelin and mm. i always say that zeppelin never had the ability to suck mm. right. they never yeah. had the ability to suck no if they would have stuck around long enough they probably would have done something crappy and people would have jumped and, and gone after them mm. but they didn't you know some people have issues within through the outdoor but and that's fine but it's still zeppelin yeah, and I, I you know think and, through the outdoors, damn good. I like the fact I that, like it. And and some of the stuff that they put out on Coda was was just ridiculous. Um, but the thing is, is that look at Hendrix. Hendrix will never have a period where he sucks. 
Stevie we Ray don't get will never have after. a period. Yeah, he'll never have his dynasty. He'll never have his, you know, Lulu or whatever that thing was. You know, <laughs> you won't you won't have that. And when bands have that, that uh, cements you for all time being up on an upper echelon because you never had a downward. You've never jumped the shark. You never made that misstep. No. Beatles never made emotional rescue. That's true. But you bring up dynasty. It, 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 here, it, the crazy thing, though, everything's so crazy now. I Was Made For Loving You is more popular than ever with the young, for some reason. My, my kids know that song. I mean, yeah. they know that. It's yeah. iconic. Oh. It... Yeah. Well, so. there's no question it's not a great composition. The question was, was it was it a good Kiss song? Right, right. You know what People it, like it. You know, another I mean, band I thought of, and I, I, I think this is where attention worked, but but all, it, it all Queen. So obviously yes. tension with yeah. right? But you had four geniuses equally. I right. had it on my list too. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. They were, they all, and that's what I love most. I love a band most when all four members equally contribute, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. John Deacon wrote two of their biggest songs, right? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's that tension there, but it all worked. four of them had top tens, and and I'm not sure yeah. if all four had number ones, but pretty, I, ra pretty rare, pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. 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 All four. But there's another uh, yeah. thumb is bigger than the than the box. And now no we... was not happy with Hot Space. You know, <laughs> no. But it's stuck together and. But, but you know, was, now Brian May, like, Brian May, and Roger Taylor were able to revive yeah. the catalog to where now they're more popular than ever it's yeah. it's incredible yeah. so. but it's interesting because when you see that uh live show from 82 uh the on fire dvd you have <laughs> you have uh freddie mercury just saying oh we did it we, we did this record it's just another record it's nothing to worry about right and it's, it's just an attitude i just made a crappy record i don't give a fuck i don't give a sh um, I don't give a thought about that. Yeah. Can edit that one. <laughs> well, and then now you, you get, can edit that one. Yeah. Um, and you get a band like Maiden where they're always just forward looking. They they they're not interested in in yeah. back. Um everything is forward, forward, mm -hmm. forward, forward. You know, well, and it'll I be have... interesting once Bruce's stuff, I don't know if it's out full yet. Is the uh, Bruce's album out yet? The full album. Uh, I don't, I don't know. think it is. Mm -hmm. You know, but it'll it'll be interesting because you know, but Maiden's popularity is is still at the apex. I still think they're the biggest. Yeah, band yeah, you can still have to just not yeah. in the U.S. But I mean, they could they could play South America every other month. Yeah, and but they're still four I mean, people in Europe. They're selling yeah. more tickets now in the U.S. than they did even back in the day. You know, yeah. They, so yeah, worldwide their popularity mm -hmm. is huge. So but, you, you know, there were there were tensions there. Obviously, like I said, Adrian left. He was fed up. Because, you know, Bruce you go back it. and listen to Made in England. I mean, it's like speed metal. Everything is a thousand miles an hour. There's no feel whatsoever. Mm. The songs are horrible. And you compare that to post-sober uh, Nico. And, of course, we hope he's okay after his stroke at the beginning of the, the year. Um, but mm. they're back in the pocket. And that was one of his conditions to come back, <laughs> is that we get a rain on these, on these songs and you know start to put this thing back back together and they've had that great run so mm. i right. just want to mention i just yeah. want to mention one band that i just thought about very much uh and that is crosby stills nash and john <laughs> and i mean i mean i read the david brown book another brown, another great great book about a band that is just dysfunctionality and it's this beautiful beautiful music harmonies galore and it's just they nearly ripped their throats off. You know, it was like, um, you know, there were infights, there were love, love triangles, there were, they wrote songs, they wrote songs where they, you know, they, they dissed each other on each record, you know, and you can actually make an album about those songs. And still, you know, that, that music, you know, to most part is worth, listening to an album like Deja Vu was done in a very, very toxic milieu, but it's still one of the best records from the early 70s. Didn't you just describe rumors? Yeah, it, yeah that, that one. Was, yeah, 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 that's yeah. a good example. Same right thing. There. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Same thing. But that definitely put out a great product. Yeah, that might yeah. be the best example. I really and that's what I wrote on here. Fleetwood Mac. Best example of all. 
<laughs> it was right across yeah, the top. yeah. But it's true. And, and it's staying true. Staying together for a bigger cause, like even though we want to kill each other, we're we know this is really good, so we're going to finish this record. But yeah. if you Almost think like about Fleetwood Mac, that was probably when they were the most dysfunctional. Because they probably kind of worked through it later. They tolerated it until Stevie finally threw Lindsay out. But right. you know what I mean? There was always that in the background and in the public. But I think that kept them together too because the public loved it. The fact that mm -hmm. Lindsay and, you know, could still be back on stage with Stevie and, you know, they still played off each other. I was going to say they played up to shit. that. They played up to that stuff too. Yeah, they played yeah. up. They knew what they were doing. But man, Rumors is the best example of that. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we probably should wrap this one up. But I think based on rumors, I think we could say that conflicts and fights within a band really do help produce a better product. I mean, there are some products that probably don't, you know, if you look at Kiss the Elder, maybe not, but I love the Elder. <laughs> but you could argue that that wouldn't have worked, you know. But, uh, well, you know, just, you know, look up. I, I don't think there, other, I think there was other a pop, musicians. I think look there up. was a product of a lack of tension. I think. <laughs> more like a carry. I don't Paul know. Paul and are like, okay, let's do a concept album. You know, okay, but, do whatever you want to do. I, well, he yeah, didn't want to do think, it. I think you know, I, I, a lot of a lot of the success stories that we've mentioned were when these bands were young and hungry, and that yeah. plays yeah. a lot into it. Yeah. So when the tension is there, but they want to do anything to make it, yeah. But eventually, the band implodes, and then then eventually, a promoter and a manager say, "Hey, come back together. We can make tons of money," and then. There you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. like the bands begin to creativity rust. isn't there anymore. Well, well like a just said, it becomes a brand, you know. It, and, and once I, it becomes a brand, they're doomed. Well, well yeah, they're a and, business. It's a business at that point. And just yeah. to throw this, and people can do it on. We won't. We won't expound on this at all. But again, this goes back centuries. We look at all of our what we call our seminal artists. You know, look at all of our classical composers. Look at our greatest painters. Look at our greatest sculptors. They, a lot of them, and most of them, live very hard difficult mm -hmm. and conflicted lives mm -hmm. yeah but out of that came things that we are still hundreds of years later yeah. uh acknowledging and and reveling in so i'm not suggesting we're going to we're going to praise rumors 30 years or 50 years or 200 years from now we'll maybe we'll not but things maybe, change maybe. taste change yeah maybe not maybe so we'll certainly look at it differently i'm sure you know mm -hmm. I would agree. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we wrapped it up. I don't know if we've changed the world, but it sure was a great conversation. Absolutely. So I want to thank uh, Peter Jones, Joe B., Tom Curlis, and Pontus for coming here tonight and having a great discussion. If you'd like to be on these discussions, we do have a uh, Patreon. You can join that. You could sign up. You could be on one of these panels if you want to. We also have a Kofi, so we would love for you to buy us a pint or a cup of coffee. We like that. We also like donations. Feel free to just send us money because we do this out of the kindness of our hearts and we just like to talk music. And that's why we're here. All right, gentlemen. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Peter Jones, for the topic. Excellent topic. Excellent discussion. And we will see you, gentlemen, on the next next one. God knows what that is, but stay tuned. <laughs>